Tarek Wilbert from the University of Melbourne, and he'll be talking about exotic Springer fibers and two-boundary Temperley weave algebras. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for coming uh, to my talk. So I want to start with something that most people probably know. So um, I'm going to study basically nilpotent n by n, n by n matrices, and uh, there's an action by the general linear group on that, just simply by conjugation, and I want to. Uh, well, look at the orbits, and there's a simple way to parameterize them. So in this case, they are in bijection simply with partitions of M. <laughs> and so this bijection is pretty simple. So you just uh, pick your nilpotent element, bring it into Jordan normal form, and then um, uh, your Jordan blocks, since this is a nilpotent element, they all kind of look like this. So um, you basically just encode the size of the different blocks uh, in your partition, and that's, that gives you your bijection. So a different place where you might have seen partitions is uh, representation theory of the symmetric group. And in particular, if you look at the irreducible representations of the symmetric group, um, then they are labeled uh, by partitions as well. So for each partition, there's an irreducible special module. And so obviously, there's no bijection between these orbits and, um, well, irreducible representation of the symmetric group, and you can um, wonder if this is just a coincidence or whether there's actually some deeper meaning behind this. And usually, I mean, you can have many different things which are parameterized by the same set, but in this case it turns out that this is actually uh, more than just a coincidence. So is there a way to get, uh, get directly from the left to the right? Um, yes, there is. So what you do is you pick uh, some orbit of some element x, x and you can associate to this um, an algebraic variety called uh, the Springer fiber. And those of you who were here last week probably are all experts on this stuff now. But here I recall the definition real quick. So you can think of this type A Springer fiber just as nested uh, flags inside C to the M. And there's this additional condition which says that if you apply your nilpotent element here to some of the spaces, you basically end up uh, one space below in your flag. And um, so, yeah, this uh, doesn't really depend on the actual choice of element inside your orbit. And if you pick different elements, the varieties will be isomorphic. Um, so this is really an assignment from the orbit to some variety of isomorphism. So in the last step, you want to get an irreducible representation. And how do you get a vector space from a variety? Well, one thing you could do is you just take singular cohomology uh, with complex coefficient in this case, which gives you a complex vector space. And uh, the result due to Springer is now that there does exist an action of the symmetric group on this cohomology ring. And if you look at the top degree, the top non-vanishing cohomology degree, um, this is actually the irreducible representation labeled by uh, the Jordan type uh, of your operator that you choose. Um, right. So. Now, I mean, an obvious question would be, well, what, what happens if I replace a symmetric group, which is a wild group of type A, by, say, some other um, wild group? In this case, I'm going to look at the wild group of type C. And in this case, it's also a classical result. that These are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, bipartitions of M. And so the big question is, what do I put on the left? And um, so. Well, one solution of this would be to just take basically nilpotent elements inside, in this case, the Lie algebra of type C. Um, and this works. It gives you some sort of Springer correspondence, but it involves a component group. Too. So there's a, a little bit more uh, data that you have to introduce. And it doesn't give you an explicit um, or like a, a concrete, it doesn't give you a bijection between orbits and these irreducible representations. So you have to do something slightly more complicated if you really want to get a bijection. And um, so in order to explain this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at uh, this 2M dimensional vector space, and I'm going to equip this with some symplectic form. So don't worry about this precise form of the, or the precise way I'm writing this form. Um, just remember these vectors. So I have E's and F's, and they form a basis of my vector space. And um, so now I can look at the corresponding symplectic group, so all linear automorphisms of this C to the 2M which preserve this symplectic form, and I can just act um, by conjugation on uh, GL2M. And in this case, it turns out that this actually 
So the symplectic Lie algebra is a direct summand here. So why do I care about this? So I still have to tell you what I want to put on, on the left side uh, on the slide. And so I can do this now. So what you're considering is something called the exotic nilpotent cone. Um, and so you take your old nilpotent cone in GLM, which is your N there, and you intersect it with the complement of the symplectic Lie algebra down here. And then there's additional, there's some additional vector that um, comes from the first factor here in the definition of your exotic nilpotent cone. And then you can act on this thing by the symplectic group and look at the orbits. And it turns out that they're in bijection um, with bipartitions of n. So this actually appears in um, a paper by Vermont and Anthony Henderson. So they have uh, studied this very explicitly. Um, yeah, so we have that. And uh, so you have a bijection between certain orbits and representations of the Weibull of type C. And uh, now, if you want to go from left to right, you can do this in a very similar manner. So this way, you just take an, uh, an orbit corresponding to some pair, so of a vector inside C to the 2M and some uh, nilpotent element. And, in, and then you associate with this um, the exotic Springer fiber. So the difference here, so, okay, so let, let's look at this. So here we are inside our two M-dimensional vector space. So, and this time I'm only gonna uh, look at vector spaces which are of uh, dimension M at most. Um, and I'm requiring that this thing is a Lagrangian um, uh, subspace with respect to my form here, which I fix. And then you still have this condition, which, which is the same as in type A. And uh, your E here, um, this comes into play by saying, well, I want this E to be contain yeah, contained in my uh, space of dimension uh, M in the middle. Yeah. and. Um, yeah, so in, in the last step, you take again the cohomology of that and you can construct um, your usual representation that more precisely uh, by Cato. Uh, yeah, you can again look at the top degree cohomology of this exotic Springer fiber and it gives you um, an irreducible representation um, of the Y group of type C. Okay, so that's sort of the background story. So what I want to do now um, is the following. So I would like to understand the geometry of these varieties a little better because usually they're extremely poorly understood. And this comes also from the fact that these actions, they're not coming from an action on the space, but um, you have to uh, define them using very complicated machinery of uh, algebraic geometry such as perver sheet. And um, yeah, so as I said, the, the structure of these varieties is not well understood. And today I want to focus on one special case uh, for the exotic Springer fiber where I'm going to look at a one row bipartition of this form. So I basically just have, um, well, two lines of boxes. Um, and what do I mean I want to understand them combinatorially? So this is what I'm going to put here because my latex skills aren't that good. So I <laughs> have to draw this on the board. So the combinatorics that appear here is the following. So I fix some rectangle here. And I fix, uh, say, uh, M nodes here on top. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to well, connect some of them by, by a cup. So something like this I'm going to call a cup. And I'm also allowed to uh, connect some of these vertices uh, to the left um, vertical edge of this rectangle and also to the right. So something like this. And I should say that this should be crossingless. So it's uh, some, some crossingless uh, diagram. And so this, these are sort of the combinatorial tools that we're looking at here. Um, and for all purposes, I have to introduce one more thing. So I'm looking at these partitions, um, uh, K and M minus K, so bipartitions of this form. And I'm going to single out a specific set of certain elements like this. Um, so this notation should just be uh, all cup diagrams of this form, um, such that uh, yeah, the number of cups, so this is a cup, and this is a cup, plus um, the number of uh, half cups, and now I'm counting um, 
right half cups. So this would be a right half cup. This is something I'd call a left half cup. So if I take this sum, I want this to be equal to m minus k. So this gives you some subset of diagrams uh, which look like this in general. Okay, so this is some combinatorics. So how can I relate it to the geometry? So that's um, the question now. So before I do this, um, uh, let me, I need to fix some representatives. So the goal here is now, first of all, so if I look at these bipartitions of this form, what kind of pairs um, are in the orbits labeled by this? And um, well, here I pick a specific representative. So for example, you can take a nilpotent element x, uh, and um, it acts on the basis like this. So E1 and F1 are sent to zero, and other than that, um, your nilpotent element acts like this on my basis of C to the 2M. And then if I take EK, so EK, this is now one of my Jordan basis vectors here. So, and which one I pick depends on the number of boxes in the first uh, partition. Um, but anyway, so if I pick this pair EK comma X, then this is actually a representative of uh, such an orbit labeled by uh, this bipartition. Okay, so now that I have that, I can actually look at the, the Springer fiber, and uh, one result here that we have is the following. So if I uh, look at this setup, um, which I described above, now there is a bijection um, between these kinds of cup diagrams and the irreducible components of um, that Springer fiber. So this itself is, is not a big result because, I mean, this basically just counts the irreducible components. Um, and, uh, well, you, can, you could count them before. I mean, it's basically essentially contained in, in Carter's work. But the point why we want to parameterize them in terms of these cup diagrams, this is precisely the point here. And this is the second part. So, yeah, so given such a cup diagram A, I'm going to associate this um, irreducible component Ka with that. And um, the point now is that these combinatorics, they explicitly describe these irreducible components. And um, so how is this done? Well, um, such a component, Ka, it consists precisely of these flags, where if I have um, some cup here, so this notation, uh, ij, this is supposed to mean a cup. So whenever I have a cup, uh, the, the space sort of sitting at the right endpoint of such a cup is completely determined by some inverse image of um, a vector space which sits uh, precisely, well, one step to the left of the left endpoint of the cup. So these guys are completely determined. And whenever I have this one, so this is supposed to be a left, uh, a left half or so something like this. So that is also completely determined by things that happened previously in the flag. So it's basically just fi minus 1 and you add um, one Jordan basis vector uh, by some rule which for the purpose of this talk uh, not that important. Um, yes, so um, yeah, maybe I should just do an example now. So let me look at um, m equals to 4 and I'm going to look at this, um, this uh, bipartition uh, 3 comma 1 basically. And then, well, if you want to find a representative, well, you find out that uh, if you take this uh, nilpotent element as indicated by these basis vectors and actions above, and you take your E3 uh, of your Jordan basis, then the pair E3 together with this nilpotent element, they label, uh, they're, they're a representative of this orbit labeled by 3, 1. And, um, yeah, so what's the set B31? So actually, <laughs> so here I notice I screwed up a little bit. So these rays here, you should actually, you need to connect them to the left, okay? So just take one of these guys, take some glue here, and just reattach them here. <laughs> so there's a, like a typo, but I hope uh, you understand what's going on. Um, yeah, anyway, so if you look at all these diagrams and you put in uh, three and one, uh, then you'll see that these are precisely all the cup diagrams which uh, satisfy uh, these conditions. And now associated with each of these, there are some irreducible components, and I've written them down here for you explicitly. Um, so you can really write down these flags completely explicitly in terms of your basis. And then you see that all of them are pretty much fixed in this specific example, except that um, 
For example, here you have a free choice of some one-dimensional space and a two-dimensional space. Here you have some two-dimensional choice sitting between a one-dimension and a three-dimension. So each of these components is actually a P1. And um, yeah, so in this example, I can really draw the variety for you. So it really looks like this if you also look at the intersections and you see they intersect in precisely uh, one point. Okay, so maybe yeah, in the last five minutes, um, I want to say like some things about the bigger picture um, and what I would like to see in the future. So I should remark, first of all, that a combinatorial description uh, involving very similar combinatorics like this one, uh, using these cup diagrams and with relations which look really strikingly similar to the ones that I have written down here for you in the exotic case. This has been uh, done by Fang in his thesis already in 2003 for Springer fibers corresponding to two row uh, partitions. So here you're looking at things like this. So you have, let's say, k boxes on the top and n minus k boxes uh, on the bottom. And so, yeah, so basically this is the, the analog, the usual type A analog of uh, what we have written down in the exotic case. And um, what you can do now is, um, so this is basically type A now. So let's look at these um, uh, type A Springer fibers, and then you take these, uh, pairwise intersections of irreducible components, and you take the cohomology and just sum over all these different possibilities. And this vector space can be equipped with a convolution algebra structure. And it turns out that this is very interesting, and I want to indicate this. So first of all, if you look at this convolution algebra that you get from these Springer fibers in a two-row case, you can explicitly describe very interesting representation theoretic um, situations. For example, it relates to a parabolic category O um, for GLM, where you take, uh, so your parabolic is a two-block parabolic corresponding to um, the, sh yeah, so the partition that you pick. And uh, so this is, it, well, it's essentially the same as looking at perverse sheaves on um, Krasmanians, for example. So this is the same as category O by the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence and localization theorem. It's just a different way of thinking about this. Um, then uh, this algebra here was used by Kovanov to construct uh, uh, yeah, uh, some categorification of the Jones polynomial, even the UQSL2 uh, Rechitic into Rath invariant for tangles. So it appears in low dimensional topology. Then there is a connection to finite dimensional uh, representation of the wall for our algebra. So I guess. Yeah, so this already occurred in um, Georgia's talk this morning. But the wall prowl algebra, it's a subalgebra of the prowl algebra. Um, but I'm not going to say what exactly it is. It depends on some parameter here. And if you choose this parameter sort of um, badly or maybe interestingly, then this category actually is not semi simple. And it turns out that you can actually describe it in a non semi simple case using these convolution algebras coming uh, from Springer fibers. And yeah, maybe the last one, it also relates to finite dimensional representations of the uh, general linear supergroup. Um, yeah, so this is all known in type A. And um, so what I would like to see is, of course, um, how can I replace all these things in, in the exotic case? Because basically, we can construct this algebra now, but it's like completely open problem to relate it to all these different things, I guess. So maybe this is um, something you want to think about. <laughs> yeah, I think I stopped here. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Did you get, in your case, you get a different algebra in the middle there? Yeah, it's slightly different. It's very similar, but slightly different. So that's sort of the point. I mean, it's the same combinatorics. Probably? It's the same combinatorics because the only thing that changes is, yeah, I mean, in the type A case, you basically you have the same combinatorics, but um, 
Yeah, so you have like some, some race. So usually in the literature, they, they put this race. It's also why I had them on the slides. So there was an error. So usually, so the combinatorics in type A case look like this somehow. And um, it's very similar to this one. And um, so also the structure of these things. So they are like iterated fiber bundles of, ba of base type P1. Yeah. And all of this is very similar. In, but, but it's slightly, slightly different. So you also get iterated P1s? Yeah, yeah. So in the general case, it's iterated P1s, yeah. Uh, who came up with these cup diagrams? Is it, was it? Um, yeah, so, so, oh yeah, I didn't really say anything about two boundary temple elite. So these diagrams, they appear, for example, when you look at the temple elite algebra. So okay. do you know? I'm not familiar with it, no. Okay, so the temple elite algebra of type a, it's built out of like these cup diagram combinatorics. Um, and so basically what you change is you add these two boundary points. And this is uh, an algebra which appears, for example, in, in the physics literature. I see. Uh, so okay. I think in this case, this might actually be where they first appeared, so in the physics literature. Mm -hmm. But now they've been studied by mathematicians as mm -hmm. well. Like it's a cellular algebra, and mm -hmm. you can construct explicitly cell modules and stuff like that. And um, yes, so this is where, they, where the combinatorics comes from. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you take the cohomology of these Springer fibers, you should actually get an action of the temporal leap algebra. Okay. But I haven't really worked it out, but it should, shouldn't be too hard. Mm -hmm. So the, the cohomology will actually be a module over the temporal leap algebra, which is defined in terms of these diagrams. Mm. So who did this? So who described this convolution algebra that they in this case did? Yeah. Is so that that's paper. Or no, no, that's uh, due to uh, Stroppel and Webster. And then these these little arrow these squiggly arrows all come just because once you identify that algebra that particular algebra is known to have all these connections. Is that right? So to me, like the deeper reason why all of this works is basically Kastanustic theory. So if you look at, um, say, like category O here, this parabolic category O, and you want to look at parabolic Kastanustic polynomials. So it turns out that in this case, um, they are all monomials. So this is very special uh, in this case. So like, multi like yeah. And um, so what, what happens is that you can now use these diagrams uh, to uh, compute Kastanustic polynomials. And the way you do it is you take something like this and you stick certain orientations uh, like this uh, on top of that. And um, then you call on certain clockwise oriented circles. And this gives you like some Q to the power of clockwise circles or something like this. And these will be your Kastanustic polynomials. And this combinatorics, which appears here, um, which I mean, so this algebra is basically built from this combinatorics. So it naturally appears here in terms of parabol yeah, parabolic Kastanustic polynomials. It then also appears here. So this actually, um, I mean, so Kovan, if you look at his thesis, I mean, he described all these canonical bases in, bases in his thesis. So I think, um, yeah, he, he already, he also thought about this in this way. But he uh, had this great idea of relating it to low dimensional topology by viewing these things as, like, well, certain, well, objects in an, in a cobordism category. So you have to uh, do some more work. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, the short answer is just um, Kastanusic theory is what everything, what holds everything together. Let's thank uh, Harry again.